Hello, and welcome to Overheard, the Foreign Policy Research Institute's monthly podcast that explores the national security implications of intelligence activities, irregular warfare, and political warfare. My name is Phil Vasilevsky, and I'm the director for FPRI's Center for the Study of Intelligence and Non-Traditional Warfare. Our last podcast discussed Chinese political warfare operations against the United States. This podcast will continue to explore how another of America's enemies, Iran, uses not only political warfare, but also irregular warfare to oppose American interests. To speak on this subject, we are privileged to have another distinguished speaker, FPRI Senior Fellow Chris Boland. Before I introduce Chris, and to set the stage for today's discussion, I'd like to quickly review what we mean by the terms irregular, political, and non-traditional warfare as well as the current state of affairs in the Middle East. At FPRI, we describe political warfare as the overt or covert employment of elements of national power, including cyber, economic, financial, informational, paramilitary, and political statecraft tools short of a declared war against a hostile state or non-state actor. This is what our podcast on China discussed. But Iran goes a step further in its operations and also engages in irregular warfare against the United States. Now, FPRI describes irregular warfare as a form of warfare by a state or non-state actor in which one side fights another to achieve political goals via indirect methods such as insurgency, subversion, and terrorism, and the methods used by the other side to defeat that effort. When the two are combined, irregular warfare and political warfare, to achieve the same political goals, FPRI calls this non-traditional warfare. A look at today's headlines from the Middle East confirms that warfare of all types is underway in the region. While Israel continues the battle, the Hamas terrorist group in Gaza, Hezbollah threatens Israel's security from the north, and just five days ago, Israel conducted a missile strike against Syria aimed at advisors to Hezbollah. Further south and east, the United States has struck at paramilitary forces in Iraq that have targeted U.S. forces there, and a quasi-naval war is being conducted in the Red Sea between the Houthis in Yemen and a U.S.-led naval coalition. In the background of all these actions can be found Iran. And to discover just how Iran is involved in these various efforts, what its goals are, and what means it uses to achieve these goals, we turn to Dr. Chris Bolin. Chris is a senior fellow in the Middle East program at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. He recently retired as a professor of Middle East Security Studies at the Security Studies Institute of the U.S. Army War College. Chris also served as a foreign policy advisor on the Middle East and South Asian affairs for Vice Presidents Gore and Cheney. He's a retired U.S. Army colonel with overseas tours in Korea, Egypt, Jordan, and Tunisia, and holds a Ph.D. in international relations and a Master of Arts degree in Arab Studies from Georgetown University. Chris, welcome. Thanks, Phil. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Chris, could you please describe for our audience today the role Iran is playing in these current Middle Eastern conflicts? What are Iranian foreign policy goals in general, and in the Middle East specifically, and how they come into conflict with U.S. interest in the region? Yeah, let me start. I mean, I'm a policy guy, as you are. So let me start with U.S. interests in the region. And Iran poses both a direct and indirect challenge to each of those interests in the region. Um, What I will say, kind of give you the bottom line up front, is I do think Iran is our preeminent security threat in the region. That said, they have no intention of doing so via competition on the conventional military front. They want everything they can do to avoid a conventional military confrontation with the United States that they know they would lose and that would actually threaten the survival of the regime in Tehran. So they have a very explicit strategy that focuses on asymmetric competition with the United States that exploits and uses irregular warfare, terrorism, cyber, and information um, campaigns to achieve their goals. So the top four uh, interests in the, in the region for the United States have typically been um, oil and the free flow of commerce through the region. Um, also counterterrorism, 
uh, counter-proliferation, counter-nuclear proliferation, and regional stability in the region. So very quickly, just to give you an overview of how U.S. and Iranian goals are kind of at odds there, um, in terms of oil, of course, and, and the free flow of commerce, we see Iran uh, taking both direct and indirect challenges to that. Uh, traditionally, of course, Iran borders uh, the northern portion of the Hormuz Strait, which the U.S. Department of Energy characterizes as the world's most important choke point. And often we don't think of the Middle East in terms of uh, sea or maritime choke points, but Hormuz is arguably the most important one. Over 20% of oil traffic passes through Hormuz. Iran will occasionally threaten to close the straits, but much more typically when, they're, uh, they're, when there's a heightened U.S.-Iranian tensions, Iran uses very limited drone strikes. Uh, they will capture maritime shipping. They will plant mines on international ships. Uh, in the vicinity of the Strait of Hormuz, really just to send the political signal that, um, hey, we can impose costs on the United States and the West if uh, things get a little bit too dicey and things go in a direction we don't like in the region. And right now, as you mentioned with the Houthis, they're an Iranian bat group in Yemen launching missile drone attacks on international shipping across the Bab al-Mandab Strait that uh, goes up through the Red Sea to the Suez, really is a major transit point for international shipping. It's raising uh, insurance costs on shippers, and it's also compelling folks to take a much longer route around the southern tip of Africa. So again, direct and indirect challenges to the flow of commerce and oil uh, to the global market. In terms of regional stability, and underneath that, I would say, is uh, the defense of Israel. Um, Iran sees itself as a very vulnerable state, right? They're a Persian state, they're a Shia minor or Shia majority state, but the Shia are my, are minority in the region. So they see themselves as isolated, really surrounded by more numerous Arab Sunni states that are backed by the most powerful superpower in the world, the United States. So they've developed a strategy of kind of forward defense and asymmetric competition given that. Of course, terrorism is a huge issue for the United States, particularly since the terrorist attacks in 9-11. And Iran, as you noted, supports uh, terrorist groups throughout the region, among them Hezbollah, um, Hamas, and now the Houthis as well. The US has sought to redesignate them as a terrorist group as well. And finally, counterproliferation, and this is a little bit outside the scope maybe of the uh, irregular competition, but the number one uh, threat to further nuclear proliferation of the region is Iran right now. Since the U.S. withdrawal from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or the International Nuclear Deal, Iran's ramped up its civil, civilian nuclear program. It's ramped up its enrichment to near uh, weapons grade. Uh, uranium. And so that's a very serious threat the U.S. has to take. So again, across the spectrum of U.S. interests in the region, Iran is, um, is definitely both a direct and indirect threat to those U.S. interests. Chris, you mentioned the um, Iranian support to the Houthis, who are right now, as we, we talked about in our introduction, conducting a quasi-naval war. It's a reference to the quasi-naval war or the American head with the French at the beginning of the Republic. Now we have one uh, currently going on in the Red Sea. How does Iran benefit from that? And also, how does it benefit from its support to Hezbollah and Hamas? And Hezbollah is, a, if I'm correct, is a Shia organization, but Hamas is not. And how does it benefit also from the uh, uncertainty for shipping now through the uh, this Red Sea? that the Houthis are creating with their attacks using Iranian missiles. Could you explain that to our audience? Yeah, I mean, this is absolutely critical. I mean, Iran's foreign policy, as I mentioned, is really built around asymmetric competition, right? And its network of proxies throughout the region is a major means of doing so. Um, the, the closest, longest uh, relationship they've had is with Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. And I, I think it's you know also worth remembering that Iran doesn't necessarily have a grand strategic plan for all this, but they have been excellent at taking advantage of crises and opportunities to really expand their influence. And again, you know, they see themselves as surrounded and outnumbered and outgunned. So so this is their primary means of posing 
primarily a deterrent, right, to U.S., Western, and Israeli strikes. And Hezbollah is, is excellent uh, in that regard. Hezbollah has over 150,000 missiles and rockets now that really pose a direct threat to the Israeli population centers in the north, so much so that Israel has actually compelled the evacuation of about 80,000 Israeli uh, civilians from the north, right, which is, poses both political costs on Israel, also economic costs on Israel. So these are a way really to assure a deterrent against a major Israeli strike. And the fact that these forces are postured to attack and inflict, you know, pretty substantial damage, right, on Israel um, would be something that the Iranians think would draw the United States into a conflict that we don't want, raise the cost to the U.S., raise the cost to Israel, and again, as a major deterrent toward, uh, you know, a conventional military strike on Iranian facilities in Iran. And a lot of analysts think that's probably the red line for Iran. If there were a direct military attack on Iranian territory, that would be a red line where it would kind of trigger a more forceful response from Hezbollah in the north um, of, uh, of Israel. And of course, in the south, you know, the other competition Iran has, of course, is Saudi Arabia as major Arab uh, Sunni state directly competing with Iran for religious leadership in the international Muslim community, the Ummah, right? So having a proxy in Yemen that is actually right on the doorstep of Saudi Arabia poses a direct military threat to Saudi uh, facilities and population centers is that source of leverage and an additional deterrent uh, to a, you know, superior military force that is, you know, that actually is Saudi Arabia and uh, other Gulf Western aligned states in the region. So these are major sources of leverage that are absolutely essential to Iranian national security strategy. This is their forward defense um, strategy. Chris, that's an interesting uh, description uh, and a good one of how using these forces, Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, and now the Houthis provides Israel with leverage against what it sees as its greatest enemies, be it the United States, Israel, or Saudi Arabia. You also mentioned something interesting. You call this a network of proxies. And let's let's discuss a little bit about the amount of Iranian influence on, on these proxies. Um, I had the privilege of uh, taking courses at Penn by a political science professor called Alvin Z. Rubenstein, who is also a long-term member of FPRI. And he wants to describe influence in this way. He says, suppose uh, someone, it's a dark and stormy and rainy night, and you want someone to accompany you to the uh, local store at the corner. So you come up to one person, you say, hey, do you want to come with me to the store? And this person says, well, I'm already dressed. I've got my coat out. I was going out anyway. I'm going in that direction. Sure, I'll go with you. The other person you approach is at home in front of a fire, has a snifter of brandy, uh, is all comfortable and getting ready to turn in for the night. And then that person puts on their shoes, puts on their coat and comes with you, even though they had no intention before. So there's influence and then there's influence. What sort of influence do the Iranians have on each of these three major groups, Houthi, Hezbollah and Hamas? Because much of the press talks about this almost as if it is a puppet relationship where Iran is in total control. Is that true or is there more nuance to these various relations? No, I think I mean, there is a lot more nuance. Naturally, I think it's really dangerous if policymakers think there's an actual direct command and control. I mean, again, getting back to the nature of asymmetric competition, one of the advantages of exercising your influence through proxies is you have that degree of de plausible deniability, right? It wasn't us. It was these other actors. Yes, we support them, but we didn't direct them to conduct this attack. And that essentially is what um, Iran said in the wake of the terrible Hamas massacre of the Israelis on October 7th, is the Supreme Leader came right out and said, we didn't direct this attack. Um, but certainly, you know, U.S. officials have acknowledged that um, they Iran enabled the attack, right? Iran is supplying the equipment the military expertise, the training, the financial support to these organizations. So it provides them with the capability to conduct those type of operations. But Iran, by you know, 
all accounts, and again, I'm not reading classified traffic anymore, but Iran is not directing those operations. They actually have developed a, a huge degree of trust that these local actors will consider Iranian desires, right? But they're ultimately local actors. Hezbollah was founded after the Israeli invasion in southern Lebanon as a resistance movement to that in the early 80s. Hamas was founded um, after the Palestinian intifadas. And of course, the Houthis are a domestic um, Islamist movement in, you know, northern Yemen. So these all, these are genuinely you know, local actors grounded in the local culture, the local communities, they have their own local agendas. But again, they're all um, dependent on Iranian assistance to actually develop these capabilities. Um, I think the degree and span of control actually varies. It's probably a continuum. The longest, uh, most trusted relationship Iran has with these proxy groups is with Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. And I think they've got a lot of trust in Nasrallah and his leadership that he will take actions that you know don't spark a major regional confrontation. And that's what we've seen so far. So certainly Hezbollah is launching attacks on um, Israeli infrastructure and facilities and military targets in northern Iraq, but it's calibrated and it's limited. So they're demonstrating their support for Hamas, they're increasing the pressure on Israel, but in a way that um, is at least intended not to spark a broader confrontation that would actually bring the U.S. and its conventional military superiority to bear um, and potentially threaten, you know, targets and facilities and populations inside Iran itself. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, I think you have the Houthis. They uh, famously, um, Iran warned them not to invade um Aden and actually take over Yemen, but the Houthis, for their own reasons, did so anyway. So Iran has a has a say, um, but certainly doesn't uh, direct or even limit what the Houthis are, you know, gonna do. Uh, that said, uh, I think probably their support for Iranian support for various militias in Iraq and Syria. They're they're also obviously they've been very active in targeting U.S. Uh, and allied facilities in the region recently is, is a response to the is Israel-Hamas war. And, and their degree of control probably, you know, varies somewhere between those two extremes. I'd like to go into a couple of things you just said in, in, in that answer uh, regarding the, the general state of conflict in the Middle East. Uh, you mentioned, first off, that there is a lot of plausible, plausible deniability in these actions by these various uh, actors which is one of the main uh, descriptions of a covert action, which we find in political warfare. And also you mentioned that there is calibration and limited uses of force to keep this conflict below a major uh, regional conventional war. In other words, the irregular warfare. The Iranians do not wish to see a major regional conflict, certainly directed against them, uh, or breaking out in, in the region. So they wanna keep it at the level of political warfare, irregular warfare, i.e. non-traditional warfare. But when you get all of this put together, even though it is low key, do, is it not really still a state of war? It's just a non-traditional war? Uh, the Pentagon has recently said that we're not at war with Iran, but depending on how you describe war, um, are we having a de facto non-traditional war with the Iranians across the Middle East, except just not in name? Yeah, I think that's probably right. And again, that's the whole essence of Iranian strategy is to conduct these type of operations and prevent a military strike that endangers the regime in Tehran. I mean, I think Iran has probably three primary foreign policy goals. First and foremost, you always have to remember is the preservation of the regime. Right? So they don't want they don't want to provoke any kind of over reach or overreaction by the United States that would threaten their hold on power. And Iran, and particularly the leadership and the mullahs now, are facing increasing resistance domestically, right? So they're they're sensitive to that things could go sideways um, if there were a major Western strike um, on targets there. The second is really the expansion of the revolution, right? And there is a revolutionary aspect to Iranian strategy attempting to push out um, the region and their version 
of uh, Vilayat Hefek, which is ruler, you know, ruling by religious leaders in the region, and competition with Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and others for that religious leadership. And I think the third is the elimination of the U.S. military presence in the region. They see the U.S. military backing for these uh, countries in the region, both um, both Arab, Sunni, and Israel, as really the primary constraint to the expansion of natural Iranian influence in the region, right? You remember the Iranians are going to be very conscious of their own history as a Persian empire, right? When they ruled most of the known world, they think that they, you know, ought to have a voice in the region. They ought to have a voice in the world. And the, it's the U.S. military support to these other regimes that is really preventing that as a primary obstacle. So anything they can do to get the U.S. military out of the region is going to be something that they see as something that advances their national security interests. To follow up on that, let's go back even further. You're talking about history. You're talking about ancient history, uh, going back to the time of the Greeks and the Persians. Uh, let's go up not back, not so ancient, but still um, relatively far back, about 40 years. Some say that these non-traditional warfare operations between Iran and the United States go back to 1980. Um, can you provide some examples of both the regular warfare and political warfare operations that Iran has conducted in the region against U.S. interests over the past several decades and what lessons we can draw from these historical events to deal with today's issues? Yeah, I mean, I just one just to bring, you know, one forward. I mean, I think it's the, the Palestinian issue is a, is a great one, right? I mean, the um, Iranians are over a thousand miles away from Israel, right? They've got very little um, organically at stake here in the Palestinian issue. And yet they were early backers of the Palestinian movement, right? Very anti-Israel posture. I mean, when you see regime organized protests in the country. You see death to America, death to Israel, right? So very much an anti-Israel, anti-colonial um, influence and motivation, right? And I think that is, they are picking that up as a really artificial way to support the Arab cause, right? They know the Palestinian issue is near and dear to Palestine, to Arab populations. And so by being a defender of that issue. They ingratiate themselves to Arab publics in a way that really undermines the Arab leadership of those countries because the Arab leadership hasn't been able to do anything about it effectively. So they say, look, we are the true defenders of the Palestinian issue, this Arab cause that's vital to your culture, vital to your heart. So, you know, it's a recruiting mechanism. It's a way to build support for Iranian policies uh, and influence in the region. Chris, besides this use of, let's let's call it hard power, or the military, we call it kinetic operations, what are some of the non-kinetic ways that Iran uses its influence in the Middle East uh, and possibly beyond, say, possibly via cyber or economic, financial, informational, or political means? How else does it use, you know, the, the elements of political warfare to combat U.S. interests in the region. Yeah, I think cyber is a great example. And again, very recently brought to the fore with the Israel-Hamas war. But I'd say Iran's probably like a middling power in terms of developing their cyber warfare capabilities. But the Supreme Leader has actually recognized the importance of the conduct of cyber warfare. He's really established a Supreme Council of Cyberspace to coordinate uh, these programs across the uh, various national security and armed forces um, services it has on balance it has a defensive nature, right? Because we remember in the uh, not too long ago, maybe a decade or so ago, there were what many analysts assume are Israeli Western uh, cyber attacks on Israel's nuclear infrastructure, the so-called Sutsnet virus that really damaged a lot of their centrifuges and set back um, Iran's civil nuclear program. So they've developed a, a focus on defensive operations to prevent that from happening again. But it does have a, a somewhat of an offensive uh, target and focus as well. That's largely focused on uh, their domestic opponents in the region. Again, getting back to their number one goal of survival as a regime in Tehran. But they certainly have included efforts to attack relatively poorly defended 
uh, U.S., Israeli, and Arab infrastructure, um, limited efforts to uh, influence elections in the United States. Um, but I think they're primarily prevented. There's kind of a, a deterrence aspect that the U.S. and Israel have because the Iranians are very conscious of the fact that Israel and the U.S. have much more advanced cyber capacity. So again, this is where they want to they want to exercise influence. They're going to exploit cyber to the extent they can, but they want to avoid crossing a red line that would uh, that would kind of invite a much more serious forceful. A cyber response from the U.S. or Israel. Let me let me kind of bring it all together here, and can you give our audience, in your opinion, uh, an estimate of what we might expect Iran to do in the near future in the Middle East uh, regarding the issues we've just discussed, using the tools of political warfare and irregular warfare, what this means to the U.S. and what it might mean to the conduct of our foreign policy. Yeah, I think it's going to be more of the same. I mean, I think right now the Iranians are feeling pretty good in terms of where they're at. They think the Israelis and by extension, the U.S. support for Israel is really digging a hole, both for Israel and the U.S. reputation in the region. So they're going to exploit this to the full extent possible and just show how, hey, look, this is the U.S. that's really um, enabling this massive disaster in Gaza, they are American bombs, and uh, leaders in the region have actually, you know, said this. Whether it's uh, Gazan leaders or Nasrallah, they've actually gone on TV and uh, used social platforms across the way in in English, but also other languages that are, you know, highlighting the fact that this is these are American bombs. It's American armament that is killing these Palestinians, well over 25,000 now in Gaza. It is America that is causing this disruption in the region. It is America that we need to get out of the region if we want a stable, productive region. So we're going we're gonna to see much more of this. And the U.S. is in a tough spot. What about with the Houthis? In the, yep. Right now, the quasi-naval war we're seeing in the Red Sea. Yeah, I mean, I think it shows one our both Israel's deterrence has deteriorated, but the U.S. deterrence has deteriorated too, particularly in terms of preventing these limited irregular strikes, right? Again, yes, we probably, we have a deterrent to prevent a major um, attack on U.S. forces in the region, but these limited attacks by proxies, our deterrence is just not going to cut it. I think we lack the capacity, right? The um, Iranian drone and missile strikes on the Saudi Cake facilities, and I think that was late uh, 2019, um, you know, it demonstrated our inability to prevent those attacks, right? And it showed the vulnerability of Arab Gulf population centers, infrastructure, uh, two Iranian attacks that that we just don't have the capacity to fully prevent. So we're going to see this, and it's going to be very difficult for the United States to prevent that. That's going to, you know, that impacts our deterrence. It impacts our ability to reassure allies in the region. Um, so it's a tough road ahead. I think one of the things we've got to do in terms of our own uh, military posture is I think we would be well advised to kind of restructure and rebalance and frankly reduce our posture in the region because we've got a lot of these forces um, that provide us some leverage, but leverage works two ways. These are exposed forces in Iraq and Syria that are really vulnerable to Iranian strikes. So I think we've got to really rethink where we really get a bang for the buck in terms of a physical U.S. military presence and where we can draw it back and reduce it and, and make our forces less vulnerable to attacks by these irregular and proxy forces, uh, we'd be better off. It would give us more flexibility going forward. Well, Chris, thank you very much for what's been a very engaging and illuminating podcast, again, on how Iran uses political warfare and irregular warfare tools in, in a non-traditional war against U.S. interests in, in the Middle East. I'd like to thank you uh, for your comments and for attending. Thanks again for a really uh, uh, very interesting podcast. Thank you, Phil. My pleasure. I'd also like to thank our listeners for again tuning in to Overheard. If you enjoy these podcasts, please visit the Foreign Policy Research Institute website at fpri.org. 
Please also consider becoming a member of FPRI and donating to it to support our efforts to provide the public and policymakers with fact-driven, nonpartisan analysis about the most pressing foreign policy and national security issues facing the United States. We look forward to hearing from you and having you listen in to our next podcast. Goodbye.